Hi, I'm Bill Geisley of Geisley Automatics. And today I want to talk to you about a new product that we have, the Super 42 buffer spring for the M4 carbine and AR-15. In a little while, Bill Quigley, one of the lead engineers here at Geisley, is going to go through and show you some of the testing that we've done here at Geisley Automatics with the Super 42 and the stock buffer spring. He's built and designed a very interesting tester that can basically cycle a buffer spring inside a buffer tube at approximately the full auto speed of an M16. And what this allows us to do is substitute testing in-house with live fire. And we can go through different iterations of a buffer spring much quicker than having to make it and then shoot it. When we started on this project, our only goal was to make a buffer spring just a little better than the standard AR-15 buffer spring. And we, when, we looked, when we looked at the standard spring, what we found was, was very interesting. Um, when, when you look at the design calculations for the spring, you find that the maximum stress in a standard spring is about 35% of the maximum tensile strength of the wire that the spring is made for. That's a very good number. The lower that number is, the longer the spring will last, the less set it'll take. The higher that number is, the shorter that spring will last over many cycles, and it can be prone to occasional breakages. Some springs are run at 80 or 90% of the maximum tensile stress. And, and what I mean by stress, stress is the internal pressure in a component when it's loaded. Just like pressure in a submarine underneath the sea, it's the same thing. Inside the metal, the metal is resisting the force and the pressure builds up. The difference with pressure under the ocean is that this stress, this pressure, and it's in units of PSI, has a direction. It's tensile, it's compression, it's shear, or it's a combination of that. So when you look at a material, it has a maximum stress level, and, and theoretically over that maximum stress level, the, the material will break. There's a yield, there's a maximum stress, they're two different things. But basically, in spring design, you have a set stress for music wire, for chrome silicon, for any other uh, stainless steel wire or any other type of wire, and you work with that stress level. You don't want to design a spring at 95% of the maximum stress level. Most likely, it won't work very well. It might work in a couple springs, but then you'll get breakages and set. So 35% is a really good number, and when we built the standard M4 carbine buffer spring and checked it, we said to ourselves, you know, that's pretty good. Let's do some advanced materials. Let's see what we can do with it. And as we started to test, we found that the standard buffer spring and also springs made out of some advanced spring materials lost length during testing, whether it was a live fire or whether it was on our spring tester we found that if you started with an 11 inch spring and then you shot it anywhere from 500 to 2,000 rounds, that spring could lose up to an eighth of an inch of its length. And it triggered a, a thought in my mind. About a year and a half ago, I was at a, a government organization and I was in their weapons shop and I was talking to the armors and, we were, and they had about a whole bunch of M4 carbines that these guys maintained and we were talking about lubricants. These guys also ran our triggers and you know, I was giving them a, a short demonstration on our triggers, how to install them, things to look for. And I noticed on one of their benches, they had a gauge and it was basically a two by four uh, with a little channel in it and it had markings on it at the shortest level, the shortest length of the buffer spring. And I asked him about that and they said, oh yeah, when we do our weapon tear downs, he's like, that's one of the main things we check. We, we've got to check that, that length because if it goes below 10 and 1 16th of an inch, that gun will not function right. It will not run right. It will run much faster on full auto than it's supposed to. And that spring has to be changed and we change a lot of buffer springs. Well, I thought about the 35% stress level that the spring is supposed to run at and I thought about 
this gentleman's experience in the field and something, something didn't jive. You know, our testing showed the same thing, you know, that the springs would lose and, and take a set. And, and what I realized is that when you shoot an AR-15, you hear that twang inside the buffer tube. And, you know, my ears are getting really bad now that I'm getting older and I'm doing even more shooting. But you notice this, this, that twang. What that twang is, is it's harmonic waves that travel throughout this buffer spring when it's cycled very quickly inside a gun. What I mean by harmonic waves is it's just, the spring just doesn't compress and then extend. As it's going through its motion, waves travel through this, kind of like a slinky does. And these waves, as they go back and forth in, in the spring, these waves are what make that twang. But these waves, I believe that they also interfere with each other at certain points. You'll have one going one way, one going the other, and when they meet, it damages the spring. And I believe that that is where the loss of length of these buffer springs come from, that they're damaged from the harmonic motion inside this spring. So what we decided to do was we wanted to look at a braided wire buffer spring for the M4 carbine or a twisted wire. You'll see these springs in high-end pistols such as a SIG. They have these braided wire type springs. Uh, some HK guns also do. Uh, you'll also notice it in the MG42 buffer spring in the machine gun that the Germans used during World War II. These braided wire springs are very difficult to engineer because there's not straightforward calculations with these types of springs. There's a lot of empirical engineering judgment that goes into it. And over time, we have figured out how to make this spring for the, for the M4 carbine. And what we have, here's a, here's a Super 42 spring. You'll notice it's approximately the same length as a, as a standard buffer spring, but it has three stranded wires. And what these stranded springs do is they absorb energy. They're a dampener, kind of like a shock absorber. As this spring compresses and extends, the individual three wires work against each themselves and they stop the harmonic waves from traveling back and forth throughout the spring. They stop the points, the nodes at which these harmonic waves meet and damage the spring. And this is why they're used in very uh, fast acting mechanisms, such as the MG42 with its very high cyclic rate, or in artillery pieces, or in high-end pistols. So we worked the engineering calculations out, and after a lot of testing, this is what we've come up with. What you'll find when you shoot a gun with this spring, the first thing you'll find is that it's a completely different shooting experience. The twang is no longer there. The gun cycles much smoother. It cycles in a different manner where if you hand this to somebody, they're gonna, they're, and they don't know that the spring is in it, they're gonna be like, what did you do with your gun? This is completely different. I believe that you see a lower recoil rise with the Super 42 spring. I think that reliability wise, that this spring will change the reliability of your weapon and increase it because it loses much less length over time. It's approximately 100% better than a standard single wire spring. It does lose length, but very slow, very, very slow, and it's an excellent spring for short-barreled weapons, 14 and a half inch M4 carbine guns. It works really great on 16 inch barrels with a carbine length gas system which function very violently. It's extremely good on that. It has approximately 15% more force than a standard buffer spring, so it helps when your gun is running dirty. 
and trying to strip rounds off, especially steel cased rounds that you might be firing. One thing with this spring is the OD is identical, the outside diameter, but the ID is not. And that's, you can see with these three, three wires that the ID is, is smaller. So what we've had to do is you can't just buy the spring, you have to buy a buffer with a reduced shoulder length right here. So we have a mil spec buffer that comes with the spring and this buffer comes through in an H configuration. It says H1, but H and H1 are the same thing. Inside the buffer, whether it's a mil spec buffer or one you get in your M4 carbine, it has three steel weights. And they look like this right here. They're small cylinders. In a buffer that has no markings here, there are three steel weights that in between them have small sh rubber shims, three steel. An H or an H1, that's identical, that has one tungsten weight. Tungsten is a much heavier metal than steel and has one tungsten weight. An H2 buffer has two tungsten weights and one steel, and an H3 has all three weights are tungsten. The M4 carbine comes standard with an H or H1 buffer. The M4A1, which is the SOCOM version of the M4 carbine, this is the one with the heavier barrel and it has a full auto trigger group. It doesn't have the burst group. This comes with an H2 version. I've talked to some leading designers at OEMs and I've asked their opinion about buffers. And essentially, they told me that there's no reason to use a buffer. You don't want to use a buffer without any tungsten weights unless you have an extremely lightweight build, something like a gun with a pencil barrel. So what I think is, is that a lot of guns out there, AR-15s with non-H or H2 buffers, I think it's done as, an, as for economics by gun manufacturers. The gun might work, but it's not optimum. And the reason is these tungsten weights are extremely expensive. Steel weights are basically pennies. You can run these off an automatic lathe easily. These tungsten weights are centered and they're probably, I'm going to say, 100 times the cost of a steel one. So it's in the economic interest of a gun manufacturer to not necessarily put these in. And I think they try to make their guns run without these. But the way we ship it is in an H1 configuration. All guns are different. And some guns, especially a short-barreled gun like this one here, may need a different buffer than an H1. So instead of offering H2 and H3 buffers, to save money, we're providing tungsten buffers that you can purchase at a nominal cost, and all it takes is a hammer and a roll pin to knock out the polymer uh, backing of the buffer. Right here, you can knock this roll pin out, and you can pull your weights out, and you'll immediately see which ones are steel, which ones are tungsten, and you can replace one of the steel ones with a tungsten to get an H2 buffer. This allows you to tune your weapon if you need to. And a lot of these short-barreled guns, very short-barreled, 11 and a half inch and under, can very much benefit from an H2 or H3 buffer. So now we're going to watch Bill Quigley show us his testing apparatus and show us what he's done in order to prove out the Super 42 spring. You will find that if you put a Super 42 in your rifle, you will find that it runs much smoother and, and is much more reliable and it's going to run like the proverbial sewing machine. Thanks for watching. Take care. Hello, I'm Bill Quigley. I'm a designer here at Geisley Automatics. I want to talk a little bit about one of the new products we're coming out with, and that is the Super 42. It's a braided wire spring for the buffer. Uh, a lot of people can also call this a stranded wire or twisted wire. I prefer to call it braided wire. The braided wire is best suited for when you have impact loading conditions and high velocity cycling. A regular single wire usually does not give you the life expectancy as a braided wire would in these conditions. The braided wire also helps with dampening the harmonic wave as it transfers down through the spring during the spring load. When we started the design of the braided wire spring, 
There was not a lot of uh, software out there that has worked with the braided wire. It give you good calculations. Well, what we ended up doing is using mathematical calculations and a lot of research and development. Even on the uh, initial calculations, we thought we had it, we tested it, we tested the prototypes and we didn't get the results that we wanted. We went in, ended up going back in and changed the parameters on the spring as far as like the wire strand, the pitch of the coils and different things like that to get us to where we are now. And we're very happy with the results we're getting. One of the parts of the test that we run is a cycle tester that we built here in-house. And its main purpose is just to cycle through a buffer spring, a lot of cycles, a lot of rounds. And we're gonna test two of them today. We're gonna do a comparison between a stock spring and the Super 42 and let you see the differences that we show. Right now, I'm gonna go over and take a measurement of a free length for the stock spring. We'll put it in the machine, we'll cycle it through, and then we'll measure the free length again. The difference of this free length is called a set of a spring. And we'll record that number and then we'll do the same thing with a Super 42 spring so you can see the difference. I have a stock spring here. We're gonna take the measurement of the free length and record it. 10.832 inches is what we recorded on the free length of the stock spring. I'm now gonna install it in our tester. Okay, as it sits here, it's at the same compressed installed length as it would be in a rifle. First, I'll move over to the computer and I'll start the software up. I'll run it one time at a slow rate so you can see the full length of compression that the spring's gonna be under as we run the test. Right now, it's running at a very slow rate. You can see the compression of the spring. You'll actually hear the rubber tip of the buffer hit the inside of the buffer tube. It's gonna to retract to, again, the installed length as it would be in a rifle. I have the machine set up to run at simulate 600 rounds a minute, so it does fly a little bit. So for safety reasons, we're gonna put a little enclosure around it. We'll put a plexiglass lid on top of it, but you'll still be able to see the spring in action. Okay, we'll begin the test. Welcome back. Uh, our stock spring cycling test got done. It's complete, so we're gonna pull this plexiglass lid off and take the spring out and get a measurement on the free length and see how much of a set it took. Okay, we have our stock spring out. Get a measurement on it. For the measurements, I'm just using a standard pair of dial uh, calibers, digital dial calibers. And what I was trying to do before was set this in between here and rotate it back and forth to get a good number, just so you feel a little bit of drag at the end. That feels pretty good right about there. We have a measurement of 10.695 inches. We record the number. Now we're gonna run the same test with the Super 42 braided spring. First we'll get the initial free length measurement. We have a measurement of 11.043 inches. Our Super 42 springs, we aim for a free length to start with of 11 inches and it has plus or minus precision tolerance from the spring manufacturer on them. So you will get a little bit of variation on. We'll now install it into the machine.
and it will be ready to run. We'll cover it up. And we're ready to run. Welcome back a second time. Our Super 42 branch spring has completed its cycle of uh, 54,000 cycles, and uh, we're going to take it out and get a measurement on the free length and see how it did. Take a quick measurement here and we'll document it. Feels pretty good there. We have a measurement of 11 inches, 0.019. Okay, I'll do some quick math and see how much set each spring took. The stock spring took 137 thousandths of an inch set. The Super 42 only took a 24 thousandth set. There's a big difference there over the life expectancy of a spring. You get a lot more out of the braided spring than you will out of a stock spring. Got a couple of quick things to mention. This machine, it does compare apples to apples as far as our Super 42 spring to the stock spring. The results that you see here, though, don't necessarily going to see the exact same results in a weapon. It all depends on the barrel length of the weapon. If you have a can on there, shooting suppressed or non-suppressed, there's a lot of variables with your weapon. But it's the Super 42 will still exceed and uh, outlast a stock spring. Uh, one other thing about this, since it is a braided wire, it does have a smaller ID. It requires a reduced shoulder for the buffer. We have these configured in the H1, which means that it has two steel weights and one tungsten weight inside. We sell separate tungstens if you want to make it an H2 or an H3, depending on how much weight you want to put in here for the performance of your gun. So keep that in mind, but it does have a reduced shoulder for the spring. And that's a quick overview of our Super 42 spring. I hope it answered some questions, intrigued your interest a little bit. And as always, if you have any questions that we, I didn't answer here, please call the office and we'll get a, an answer for you right away. And thank you for watching.